So good afternoon all. We have gathered here today to celebrate World Wildlife Day. Uh, so I welcome you all and also I welcome the dignitaries on the dais. Today we have with us Dr. Manas Manzarekar, Deputy Director, Research and Capacity Building, Mangrove Foundation. Our guest speaker, Mr. Mihir Surve and Mr. Siddhesh Surve, Assistant Director, Capacity Building at Mangrove Foundation. So before we start the session, I would like to request Manas sir to welcome our today's guest. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to take, it, take this opportunity to introduce Mangrove Foundation and Mangrove Cell's work in the conservation of marine animals. So, uh, with regards to marine animals, uh, we work for the sea turtles. So, uh, we provide funds for the turtle festival at Vedas in Raigad and uh, Anzarle in Ratnagiri since many years which will help in spreading awareness about the olive ridley sea turtles which come to uh, Maharashtra coast for nesting. Also, we have set up uh, different turtle uh, rescue and transit centers where we uh, treat the injured sea turtles which come ashore and uh, they are being treated with the uh, experienced veterinarians. <coughs> also, we have uh, started a scheme with a uh, fisheries department uh, that is a compensation scheme for the fishermen who releases the uh, scheduled species, scheduled marine species <coughs> like whale shark, sea turtles, guitar fish by cutting their nest. So, the total compensation is up to 25,000 depends on the species they release. And also, we have uh, provided funds for the small and large projects with, uh, with regards to conservation of uh, coastal and marine biodiversity. Now I would like to call upon Dr. Manas Madhrekar to uh, brief about the importance of today's uh, violet. Day. Thank you, Sati. Uh, a very good morning to all of you and uh, I hope that uh, all of you have had a very informative uh, mangrove trail and visit to our center and have uh, had the opportunity to uh, observe a lot of uh, migratory birds in the Thane Creek. <laughs> so uh, today we have uh, gathered here uh, on the occasion of the World Wildlife Day uh, which is celebrated on 3rd of March and uh, it is celebrated today because today is the day when uh, the CITES was signed, that is the Convention on International Trade in uh, Endangered Species of Flora and Fauna. It was signed on 1973 and that's why, uh, that's the importance of this day. So, uh, when we talk about endangered species, India has a very rich uh, biodiversity and unfortunately, I mean many species uh, uh, do face extinction today, they are threatened with extinction. And uh, specifically when we come to coastal and marine biodiversity, uh, many species uh, come to our mind uh, which are uh, threatened today. There are many species of mangroves, uh, we have whale sharks, guitar fishes, sea turtles, dolphins, otters and many more. So uh, today in India, uh, there are many efforts being made for the conservation of these uh, protected species. And uh, in Maharashtra specifically, the Forest Department of Maharashtra, the Mangrove Cell and the Mangrove Foundation is uh, contributing a lot towards the conservation and protection of these uh, endangered species. So, uh, talking about uh, marine endangered species, one group of animals which uh, comes to our mind always is the cetaceans, uh, common, uh, rather uh, in common terms whales and dolphins. And, uh, <coughs> Uh, I am sure that many of you must have seen uh, dolphins uh, because nowadays dolphin rides are quite common on many of the beaches in Maharashtra. Uh, you may have also seen dolphins in Mumbai, you can see them from Marine Drive or places, other places in Mumbai. And uh, <coughs> today actually, uh, I mean uh, some of the most commonly seen dolphins like the Indian Ocean Humpback Dolphins uh, do feature on the IUCN Red List, they are endangered animals. Uh, so, uh, today we have with us uh, Mr. Uh, Mihir Soli, uh, who is a marine biologist and uh, a cetacean expert who has been uh, working on cetaceans in Maharashtra for more than a decade and uh, he has also been working with Mangrove Cell and Mangrove Foundation for quite some time now. Uh, 
so um, we hope that we have a very engaging session today with uh, Mr. Mirzoy, uh, and uh, I hand it back to Sai. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, now I take the privilege to introduce you with our today's guest, Mr. Mihir Sure. Uh, he is a marine biologist and has been working on cetaceans and fisheries since 2011, largely on the waste coast. Uh, he is a part of team of researchers and forest department officials which work for developing a monitoring network of marine megafauna, <coughs> stranding and sightings. He is being associated with Mangrove Cell and Maharashtra Forest Department since 2012 in regards with the cetacean work. Now, I would like to request Mr. Suresh to please start the session. Okay. It is experience from my perspective and start with where we started our work. So, way back in 2005 or 6, we went to uh, Marwan with BNHS and we were on a, uh, they had a marine biodiversity course at that time. And we saw uh, dolphins while standing on the single coat. And we went back home, googled what dolphins they were. We didn't really find anything. And we were really curious. I mean, there are dolphins within sight of the shore. And we didn't find any papers about them. And nobody really knew what they were. We dug a little bit more and we found standing reports of these dolphins and figured out that they're humpback dolphins. They were called Susa Chinensis then. And we're like, okay, they're close enough from land to see why has nobody studied them. And in the first few years, we were, well, your age. And just out of our masters, we decided to work on these dolphins. But no organization at that point thought that, you know, it's easy enough to work on dolphins in India. They thought you need big ships. So we ended up writing a small Ruffords grant and started our work, uh, which ended up being the single citation project and went on for a long time. Our work, as you can see, is along the southernmost district uh, in Maharashtra, in Sindhudu. And it was largely in inshore habitats, which is very near to the coastline. Because our funds were very limited, we couldn't go far out to sea. But what we found out <coughs> is that the dolphins were in the shallow waters. As you can see in the picture, you see the pin. And the dolphins were also present in a habitat where there were a lot of fisheries. So we f uh, figured that the easiest way to know about the dolphins is maybe ask the fishermen. Because that's a lot cheaper than renting a boat and you know going after the dolphin. Uh, so we did a few months of interview based work where we showed fishermen pictures of these dolphins, asked them what they know about them. What we realized in the end, we published a paper about it. You can get a picture and read this if you want. Uh, but what we found out is that these dolphins are not target species for fishermen. Uh, when you ask a fisherman about, say, Bangra or Tarli, he can give you a detailed description of when they occur on this coastline, when's the breeding season, all of that. But the dolphins are mostly pests that they encounter. Like an elephant comes and raids farms, these dolphins would raid nets. So they didn't know as much about the dolphins as they knew about the fish. So we realized that we do need to get on the water. But this gave us an interesting perspective on an animal that everyone thinks is cute. Like when you think of dolphins, we think of friendly animals, but they're not. They're wild animals that interact with humans in the same way other wildlife does. And in a habitat which is so closely correlated, like shallow waters, there is going to be conflict. And this was our first introduction to dolphins from the human perspective. So after that, we rented a very beat up old fishing boat, modified it a little bit and we use it for transect surveys. So this is generally how transects work, where there are three observers, one at the front, two at the sides, and every once in a while we do scans with binoculars, otherwise we're using naked eyes. So uh, we did transects in two different methods. Uh, so here, these dolphins uh, are found in a specific gradient. Like if you look at flamingos and other waders, uh, some waders with short legs will be found in shallower water. So the ones with larger legs will be in deeper water. Similarly, these dolphins prefer very shallow waters. So the distribution pattern for these dolphins is based on the gradient of the, like the depth gradient. So when we're doing the transect, so find out presence absence, we need to do these surveys across the gradient. Because you know roughly where the dolphins are. You can't just survey that area. You need to look at the boundaries of that area. And for that, we had to go outside the area. 
So we planned lines accordingly, and uh, as naive as these lines look, like they look really <coughs> fun on the screen. Each line used to take us like six or seven hours, and then it used to take maybe eight hours to go back. So it used to be a 14, 15 hour day on the boat. Uh, after that, it's a lot of waste of fuel and time. So we decided that now that we have a general idea of where these dolphins are found, uh, we did surveys within the area where there was maximum density to get uh, estimates of population and stuff. This is what we spent most of the time on the boat doing. Because you're either going to the line or coming back from the line. You have nothing to do. And the boat makes a saintly eight or nine kilometers an hour. So, as I said, the most common species that we found in these waters was the uh, Indo Indian Ocean humpback dolphin. When we did the survey, they were Indo-Pacific humpback dolphins. <laughs> so, uh, the names changed. It used to be Susa chenensis, now it's a different species. And another species that we found, uh, which we did not know based on papers and stuff, was uh, finless porpoises were quite common in those waters. And these animals are really difficult to photograph. Now, this is one of three photographs I have of them, I think. And we have like about one and a half lakh pictures of dolphins. Just gives you a comparison. Half the time when we used to see them in the beginning, we used to think it's either a tire or a little coconut floating in the water. So it's very difficult to spot these and it took us some practice to uh, find them in the waves. We were also very surprised when in some seasons we started seeing whales. Now this is a broody's whale. It's a relatively small species of whale. It grows only to 15 meters. And uh, I mean, here uh, what you see, the one in the top uh, is a large adult whale. The uh, one in the middle, that's a baby. Like uh, these were mother calf pairs that we were seeing in very shallow waters. Uh, if you see the map, the uh, the line here. <coughs> yeah, the dark green line that you see. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, see this line is 15 meters. So, as I said, the whale is just 15 meters in length. So, for this whale, it's very shallow water. So, we realized much later that these whales are coming in such shallow waters because there was fisheries depletion, possibly outside. So uh, because of that, we were bringing calves right into very shallow waters to look for fish, which is a high risk behavior, given the fact that, you know, there are cases, uh, I mean, there are risks of stranding. And the same year, there were a lot of reported standings and the stranded whales also were uh, emaciated. You could see that the whales were really thin in those years. Oh, by the way, the calf in the middle photo surfaced right next to our boat. And it was like almost three-fourth the length of our boat, it was about two meters away. So that photo is from there. Interestingly, we also had one striking of a blue whale. Now this was from very far away and uh, this is what we saw. Uh, and when we so, uh, showed this picture to experts later, they said that, do you see that fin in the uh, image below? That's not a dorsal fin. I mean, blue whales have a very tiny dorsal fin. So this is actually a calf which is on its side and it's uh, drinking milk. So uh, it's feeding from its mom. That's what the picture is. So again, this was a mother calf pair. And that too was in very shallow waters, like 15, 16 meters of water. Now, when we saw these dolphins, they were frequent enough that we could do more detailed work with them. So we began with how often we see them like encounter rates. We looked at uh, pod sizes, how many animals are there in one group or in one sighting. And these were one of the most common animals found there. <coughs> the next common ones were, uh, oh hold. So one interesting finding that we had was the group sizes were huge. So in the studies that we had referred to before, the maximum group sizes that we had seen was about 30 animals. And here, if you can see, we have seen groups of up to 120 animals. So uh, based on our reading, our hypothesis is that on the west coast, our uh, rivers are really short and monsoon driven. So they bring in a lot of nutritional influx. And this acts like how upwelling does in deeper waters. It brings in nutrition. The nutrition gives rise to blooms of you know, algae that 
are fed on by fish and these fish or the other fish that feed on it are what drive this ecosystem. So it's a very rich ecosystem that uh, allows this high uh, number of predators in the water and these are large predators. You know, each of them weighs 200, 300 kgs. So such high group sizes can only mean very rich waters, which also means a lot of fisheries. So I mean, there is again circling back to the conflict because it's same shallow waters that these dolphins and the fishermen are using. Uh, interestingly, we saw a lot of groups of finless porpoises also, which were also in very large groups again. Uh, here, finless porpoises, the papers that we read said they were maximum groups of 8 or 10 animals. And we've seen up to 55 animals. Just like everywhere, we see that these little heads bobbing in the water. And generally, when we used to spot them, the water used to be quite calm. So, just for reference, this is what a porpoise looks like. As the name says, finless, it doesn't have a fin on its back. So, uh, Rohan Chakravarti did this uh, illustration for us, the green humor. Okay. We were also looking at what area uh, these dolphins were using in. And we did sort of these heat maps of where uh, the dolphin presence absence was. If you look at these red spots, most of these areas uh, are centered around estuaries. So wherever rivers are flowing in, they're bringing in nutritional influx, that's where these dolphins are choosing to hang out. Uh, the finless porpoise sort of had a similar pattern, uh, but they use slightly deeper waters. So if we look at the depth for finless porpoises, as you can see the peak is slightly ahead. They chose more deep waters as compared to the dolphin. And if you can see the depth, dolphins use somewhere like 8 or 9 meters depth, which is very close to the shore. It's less than like a kilometer from the shore. As I was saying, if you look at the depth, uh, it's within a kilometer where the presence absence peaks. So it makes sense that we could see these dolphins from land. The porpoises also used a similar area, but they had a slightly more uh, deeper preference for water. And this was something which was not very well done, uh, looking at estuaries, because we didn't know how to clearly look at the influence of an estuary. Like just measuring the distance doesn't work, we need to take turbidity, but those parameters were very difficult to take on the water. So this is just a ballpark that they do seem to cluster near estuaries. Uh, one interesting thing, if you notice the finless porpoise and dolphin area, they do overlap to a great deal. But we have never seen these two animals together. Like, they share the same region geographically, but temporarily they don't share the same region. So, we found out a few papers from Pakistan where this species, humpback dolphins, uh, have been known to kill porpoises. So, it's not to eat them, it's just aggression. Like in a lot of cases, uh, bottlenose dolphins have been known to kill porpoises for fun. And then they'll toss the carcass around like a football. It's just aggression towards other species, which is seen in a lot of marine mammals. So the only case that we saw was when we saw a mother calf pair of porpoise approach from one side of our boat. And there's a large uh, pod of dolphins to our left. And we saw them coming towards and we were like, looking for an interesting observation. About 200 meters out, they just went down and we didn't see them after that. So they probably came into acoustic range, heard the dolphins and moved away. So something very interesting about the porpoises is, I'll get to it in the next few slides, uh, their vocalizations are very difficult to detect. They, there must be a lot of predation pressure on them, so they don't use echolocation as much as dolphins do. They're very tiny animals, they grow to about you know four or five feet max and maybe 25, 30 kgs, the small ones. So there is a lot of predation pressure and this being going into silent mode has become a, a defense mechanism. We did sample almost across a year. So we were looking at how these animals use this area across seasons. So uh, we found out that they seem to use different areas like cluster around different areas in summer and winter, but we didn't get <coughs> enough parameters to realize why they were doing that. There seems to be a clear pattern of being more clumped into certain regions in winter, as opposed to more spread out 
in some how that ties in with uh, the nutrient influx and stuff is something that take a few more years to uh, you know unravel. So it does show a clear difference in pattern where in the summer they seem to range wider, like both across uh, the area and across the depth. But why or how we don't know. <laughs> Uh, there doesn't seem to be much seasonal variation in this or you know, not enough to... You see it's slightly deeper waters, there's like a secondary peak uh, which shows that there are some sightings beyond. But here we don't know whether it's a breakdown in how uh, their pods work, like whether in summer the males move farther out or something like that. Because as of now we have not been able to identify males and females just from images. So they look very similar. We only can do that in carcasses and that too when we are present. Like you have to turn the carcass over and check. Uh, again here uh, this pattern is too weak to make any predictions on but they seem to uh, range wider in summer as the pattern has been showing. So we also were seeing a lot of these dolphins. We uh, realized we can do some behavioral observations. And we use four uh, basic states. One is socializing, when they're interacting with other dolphins. Then, oh, sorry, I flipped the photos in the titles. So <laughs> the one on top should be foraging, where they're looking for fish. Uh, socializing is when they're interacting with other dolphins. Even, say, this photo, the one in that corner, is where the dolphins are possibly mating. That is also part of socializing. Uh, here is what we assume is male to male combat. So these are two males and they have this behavior which you may have seen in a lot of other animals, mammals. And traveling is when they are directionally moving rapidly towards a destination. Milling is when they are just sort of in an area not moving in a certain direction. So just lazing around basically. So these are the four basic states that we uh, categorize the behavior as and more than 50% of their time was spent looking for food which is foraging, looking for food or feeding. So looking for food in an area where there is so much fish is also a very time intensive effort intensive activity. So you can understand that when there is fisheries pressure, if there is so much involved in looking for fish, uh, how it will affect their lives. So we were also looking at patterns of where these behaviors were happening uh, on the map and again socializing was, uh, if you look at the general distribution that I've shown you, that's on this side. And here you see the socializing, it's more concentrated towards the estuaries. So, and it was quite uh, closely correlated to foraging, so which we have observed quite often that when they are foraging, they are in much larger groups than they are, uh, they are in say when they are traveling. So foraging happens to be a group activity also, and there is a lot of socializing happening because maybe they communicate with other pods that they are related to to communicate about the availability of food, which is seen in say ravens. And something interesting is that the tourism hotspots also overlap with areas where maximum foraging activity was seen. So this is something that was highly disruptive to feeding behavior and something that we didn't explore completely but it gave us an inkling of the fact that this might be a red flag and something needs to be done here, it needs to be monitored properly. Another red flag was that fishing intensity overlapped almost completely with the areas where these guys were feeding. Obviously because the estuaries are where the nutrient washes out, there is maximum number of fish. Humans are smart enough to know these are where you get the most fish. And fishermen even told us during the interviews that they look for areas where they see high number of dolphins and put their nets there. It was a, you know, high risk strategy because the dolphin might break your nets and steal from it. But also there might be a large catch somewhere in those waters. So they knew what they were doing. and. It's what leads to direct competition between humans and these dolphins. So during our behavioral observations, we came across something very interesting. So we saw this pair of dolphins swimming with something between them. 
the first time we actually see, these are very zoomed in photos. Uh, the first time we actually saw it, we thought it's a very normal behavior, which uh, which is seen in dolphins or elephants, where if a calf is quite young, it's not let out alone. So if you've seen pictures of elephants, the calf will be inside the herd between the legs of one of the females. Similarly, this will be either an aunt or a cousin and a mother escorting the calf on both sides. It's a way of protecting the calf. So these are matriarchal societies and these will be mostly closely related females. But in this picture, this calf is not facing up. The white part that you see is the belly of the calf. So the calf was not alive in this picture. And what was very interesting is one of the females kept pushing the calf out of the water. And if you see uh, the calf, the calf belly looks bloated. So it's not recently dead, it's dead long enough for there to be gas buildup. Uh, if you see the uh, lower part of the belly, the penis is protruding out, which means there's a gas buildup and pushing the organs out. So it's something the dolphin has been doing for hours or maybe more than a few days. And in the beginning when we were doing this, we really did not understand what this was and we just let it go. And years later, we were randomly reading a paper about something called epimagnetic behavior, uh, which was seen in a lot of mammals where uh, mothers especially have problems letting go of dead offsprings. So in the case of macaques, there have been cases where they've been carrying a carcass for months where it totally turns mummified. <clears throat> and it's a manifestation of grief. I mean, as researchers, we've been told to put our emotions aside. But here are some of the things that you miss when you do that. Because when you treat them as not having human emotions, you tend to overlook these parts that, yes, they're intelligent enough to know that this is where fish come from or nets are easier to get fish from. Then they're going to be intelligent to you know, know that this is my calf and this guy and that there is an attachment that they can't let go. This is me making assumptions, but you know, this is the kind of behavior that you would expect if you have emotional intelligence, which they clearly display. And surprisingly, there was another case that got linked because we started seeing our data through this pattern. We came across this dolphin carcass very near where we uh, docked our boat, which is floating in the harbor and there were a bunch of dolphins swimming around it. We waited for the dolphins to move away and we picked the carcass up and we conducted a detailed uh, PM. Uh, and if you see this dark mark near the flipper, uh, I'll come back to that. So you see these marks all across the dolphin. They're on the tail and the rest of the body. So these are called rake marks. But what's very interesting is that rake marks happen only generally between adult dolphins. It's a way of greeting each other. So like you and I would shake hands or hug, they rake mark or rub against each other. But they don't do that to uh, juveniles or infants because that will obviously cause injury. So it was very interesting to see such deep rake marks because you don't generally see blood drawn or you know skin completely scraped. So, when we shared these images with some experts, they said that this might be an indication of where the dolphin, like the baby was grabbed and pulled to the surface, which started making sense when we opened up the carcass, because this injury had resulted in a perforated lung. So the dolphin had been hit hard enough here that this lung had exploded. <coughs> and not just that, the lung had exploded and healed. There was scar tissue. So the dolphin didn't immediately die after this injury, it had actually survived it. And the indications of these rake marks were actually possibly pod members pushing it to the surface. It's a mammal like us. It's not a fish, it's not going to breathe underwater. So every two, three minutes it has to be pushed up, like that mother was pushing that carcass. So it's very instinctive, it's probably something that a large part of the pod kept doing for days or weeks for scar tissue to develop. But the dolphin didn't make it in the end because it was a very serious injury. So it was interesting to see that so much effort was put in by possibly all the calf, uh, all the family of the calf, the whole pod, uh, to keep the calf alive for that long. 
we also presented a paper about it, which was interesting. I mean, it, it was a behavior note that came out of data that we didn't know we had by reading some random papers later. Coming back to the data, I mean, we knew generally where the dolphins were found, what they did, what areas they used. Uh, we wanted to look at how many dolphins were present. So there are various methods of doing this. Uh, what we chose was what is called photographic mark recapture. Now, you guys might be familiar with this method being used for, say, tigers, where they, or leopards, where they put in camera traps and use the stripes of the tigers or the spots on the leopards to identify individual animals. When we look at dolphins, what do you think we use to identify them? Any guesses? Not really. So the spots uh, might be because of sunshine, the body is wet, so they change. What we use, I mean, what stays fairly consistent is scars on their fins. So their fin shape is a result of how their growth is or whether they cut, uh, get cut with fishing lines because of other dolphins. So as they age, these scars kind of develop on their uh, dorsal fins, which is very thin tissue compared to the rest of the body. Also, we use the patterns, the color patterns, but we only use them within season because they change rapidly as the dolphins age. So uh, we don't rely on them completely, it's largely shape based. So we use the uh, images of the fins to identify these individuals and uh, use this method called mark recap to uh, get population estimates. Now in a lot of the images or, uh, on our surveys, we saw what are called clean fins. So if you look at a mother calf pair, the calf has no identifying character. So that's what we call a clean fin. Now we look at the dolphins, we take pictures. At the same time, we also record that there are 19 individuals around, but there are also six clean fins with it. So we have a ballpark of what percentage of the animals reported there are clean fins. So you use these estimates later to uh, you know, get an estimate of the entire population, not just of the adults. Here, so here are some of the individuals that were very clearly identifiable. Uh, now, this is... Uh, how many animals we have seen multiple times. So we identified 570 odd animals in total. What? A large percent of those, like 428 of those animals were only seen once. Which means that the data collection that we did was fairly inadequate. But this is two and a half years of data collection. And we didn't get funding beyond and there were a lot of complications. Which tells us that we need to keep working on this later. But you know, things don't always work out. I mean, because there are so many animals, the number of data points needed is very high. So here we had some 11 odd thousand, how many? 12,000 images? Uh, 18. 18,000 images were used. So 18,000 data points were used. And 18,000 after... Uh, after so cropping yeah. out the, I mean, we had to identify the animals, so it had to be really good images, which had to be bang on, per, uh, you know, perpendicular to the boat, no angles would do. So cropping all those out, we came from a few lakh photos down to 18,000 images. And this is how many animals we identified from it. Few lakh photos and really bad eyes. She did most of the uh, sorting work. <laughs> so little dig there. <laughs> so here are the animals that we uh, saw most frequently. And the maximum number of recitings were for this animal, which is number four, which was seen eight times, which is not very high. Because in small studies, sometimes you get like 50 or 60 points from an animal, and you can get some very interesting patterns from it. I'll come to it in a bit. So this is what is called a discovery curve. So as I keep going on the water constantly and looking at animals, what I expect is for that blue curve to flatline. Because I'm going out every day, I'm clicking individuals, at some point I don't see new individuals. You go to college on day one, 99% of the faces you see are new. At the end of the first month, you're not going to see any new face. That's where your discovery curve flattens. That is what we expected with this data. It did not happen. There were a lot of students in the class. <laughs> 
So we also had a few other complications uh, because you need to take photos of these animals from a fairly small hole. The height of the wave needs to be shorter than the height of the fin because if I get obscured fins, it's going to result in bad identification. So fin is never normal. Fin is always so windy that we have never been able to collect data there. And this whole patch of the monsoon, we couldn't ever collect data because the sea is really rough. So it's, I mean, it's because of where we live. The monsoon season comes here, you can't sample during that time. So we had to look at some other alternatives, which we'll come to in a bit, of sampling during those times to know what the dolphins were doing then, because that's a complete black zone. We don't know where they are, what they do, whether they scatter, whether they come in shallower or deeper waters. It's all guesswork. So based on this uh, work, we realized that uh, you know there are around 750 animals uh, that were identified. And oh, okay, the population estimate was a little more, no? No. Okay. Huh. So ballpark 720 animals uh, with a range of about 700 to 750. So as our data gets better, we might get narrower ranges of the confidence interval. But we didn't have enough data to get a more robust state. Which was good enough, this was the first ever population estimate for this region. So we at least know how many animals this region can support and that this is a very healthy number. And we don't know again whether this is because uh, there is higher fishing pressure in Goa and in Ratnagiri and which is causing clumping in this area or whether it is actually a healthy ecosystem. Again, speculation here. So the thing I was talking about having more data points. So if I have enough data points, I use something called a least convex polygon, which is a GIS mapping tool to get a map of what area the dolphin actually uses. So you get a home range for the dog. But this is a very crudely done one. Uh, so it didn't work very well because I just had eight data points. Just to give you an example. But you have something like 40, 50 uh, images. You can get home ranges of these dolphins. Also, we could do associations. So if you see, say, individual number four and six together all the time, their home ranges seem to match. Then you could fairly certainly say that they are from the same pot. And in such ways, when you have multiple data points, you look at these correlations and you could identify family groups or you could identify groups with interact, which interact with each other during foraging. So these are the kind of data nuances you could get with say 20 years or 15 years of data collection. We are nowhere near there yet. So as I was saying, if there's bad weather, we can't be on the water. It's a fairly limiting system. Another thing is our work is limited to daylight hours and the dolphins, we don't know what they do after evening. So is there any way of finding out? So we uh, had a few collaborators in the UK who were nice enough to send this research equipment called a sea pod. And we deployed them in uh, two areas. <coughs> One is Surgery Court, which is right outside where our boat is, uh, boat is docked. And uh, it's a fairly undisturbed area. The other one was uh, near Devagar Nimti, which has a lot of fishing traffic. So our basic intention was to look at how fishing intensity affects the dolphin's presence, absence, and whether patterns are different. Because they're very similar areas otherwise. It's an estuary uh, in both cases with sort of uh, rocky outcrops surrounding it, so which provide sort of sheltered waters. So on paper, geographically very similar, except for one parameter, which is what we were looking to study. Uh, random digression, but we found that these dolphins have an incredible acoustic range. This graph is in kilohertz. Our hearing frequency is that black bit in the corner, 0 to 20 hertz. So everything that they produce is like you know, 140 kilohertz of range. So our voice, like what we can produce is about 5 to 7 kilohertz max. I mean that's our acoustic range, somewhere from 20, 30 hertz to 
5 kilohertz of acoustic range. Here we have 140 kilohertz of acoustic range, which is incredible. And uh, interestingly, when we look at finless purposes, as I was explaining earlier, they have lost most of their acoustic range uh, in lieu of being undetected because there's a lot of predation pressure and evolution has driven them in the direction where they've become largely silent. <coughs> so it's better to stay alive than to communicate for them. Because uh, a lot of other uh, marine mammals which can hear this frequency can also hear them and eat them, like false killer whales or killer whales. So because of that, it seems to be a evolutionary adaptation. What happens because of this is, uh, if you remember your physics class, higher the frequency, uh, lesser the distance it travels. So if you have a very low frequency sound, like a blue whale producing a 50 hertz call, can be heard across oceans, but a call at 140 kilohertz can't be heard for more than 100 meters. So when we put our microphones in the water, we can't hear them at all. So very low detection of these. I mean, you need very fancy equipment to hear finless porpoises underwater. Uh, so we got some few months of data from here, and uh, there's not enough data to give a pattern on. But we see some interesting pattern here that there are overlaps of you know uh, porpoises and dolphins happening on the same day, but there are large patches where there are only porpoises and no dolphins. So there does seem to be some, you know, temporal stay away zone for the porpoises when the dolphins are around. Uh, unfortunately, we lost both these pods. Uh, we left them over the monsoon thinking we'll get monsoon data. They got washed away. There was uh, 170 kgs of concrete and steel holding it down. They just vanished. <laughs> I mean, we were searching for them for the next year or so. We dive, we put in ropes with hooks and everything. Nothing, no trace. And about eight, eight months later, one of the pods turned up in a trawler. Now we've been there long enough that somebody from the trawler called us saying, hey, you have research equipment. Mein aala. But the other pod just vanished. <laughs> but we found another pod. And deployed it in such a court this time because the Devbal one seemed like it was not going to stay. And we got some interesting dial patterns of activity. So we sampled them from say 7 in the morning to 4. There is a very lax activity period. Most of their activity happens at night when we aren't on the water. Can you explain what DL is? Oh. So uh, DL patterns is their activity across the day. So if you look at this, it's 24 hours. So 0 is 12 o'clock at night, uh, 7 is 7 in the morning, uh, 14 is 2 o'clock. So military time, 24 hours time. So if you look at this pattern, it calculates the pattern of activity across the day. So they're looking at the number of whistles that happen around this port. This is not an exactly right estimate because these animals might be active a little away from the pod. But assuming that they are around the pod and this only calculates activity for the time when the dolphins are present. So in the time when they are present, how active are they? Are they milling or are they very active and socializing or foraging? So by the looks of it, they seem to be more active during the night hours when they are not on the water. Which was something we couldn't have found out with, without this stuff in the water because how would we know otherwise? <clears throat> and the pattern seems to be very similar for porpoises. So activity peaks at like 19 hours, which is 7 in the evening. Uh, and they stay active till like 4 or 5 in the morning, which is again when we are not on the water. <laughs> so here again is a very short time, like uh, 6 months of data, activity time over the hours. Uh, because this is a slightly longer time zone than the previous one. The previous one was based on one month of data. Here, uh, the differences are not as stark. But again, you see peaks in the very early hours. So, I mean, maybe it's too sunny, they, they prefer colder water, something like that. Oh, so uh, I have a colleague who works on the acoustics of these uh, species. 
So she has been using a hydrophone, which is a microphone used underwater, so just a dipping hydrophone, and she records the dolphin's uh, acoustics. So they can be classified into three basic types, clicks, which is, hey, I need to look for that file. It might be in the other slide, I'll, I'll come back. <coughs> so the lines that you see, they're clicks, they use them to uh, find food underwater. The, they are very high frequency, so this graph does not capture it. As we saw from the previous graph, they go up to 160 kilohertz. This is only up to 90 kilohertz. Uh, the next are whistles, which are comparatively low frequency. They are up to 10, 12,000 kilohertz, still on the upper end of our hearing range. And burst pulses, which are clicks, which are compressed very uh, close together. So imagine a dolphin find the fish far away. Now as it starts approaching, the fish is also moving away. So it needs to produce clicks faster and faster as it goes nearer and nearer, right? So the clicks sort of compress into what is called a burst pulse. So these are uh, things that we would use uh, to determine whether the dolphins are feeding or not. When we see a lot of clicks and burst pulses, we know that they are uh, feeding in the water. A uh, lot of times, they use whistles and burst pulses for uh, communicating with each other. So they are using their sonar to find out where the other dolphins are and communicating with them using whistles. So a lot of, lot of whistling and a little bit of mixed burst pulses and clicks tells us that they are socializing. So even with acoustics, when we can't clearly see the dolphins, we can get a fair estimate of even behavioral uh, you know, cues on these animals. So I think this is what Isha is currently doing in Marwar. Oh yeah, so here are some recordings of those. Uh, that one is uh, whistles. is probably from a socializing uh, encounter because as you can see in the background, you see those clicks and burst pulses. So they're trying to find out where the other person they're talking to is because they can't use sight. The waters are really murky. So if I'm talking to somebody, I need to be looking at them. That's how we direct communication. So in the same way, they're going to be finding out where that other dolphin is using their burst pulses and then communicating using the whistles. That's at least the current hypothesis. And these whistles have been slowed down about 10x for us to hear them like that. The next one is uh, just pure foraging sounds. So it just clicks. <coughs> so when they're foraging, they will not whistle a lot because that might give them away to some fish. Maybe if they are foraging in a large group, they sort of whistle a lot. I don't know how that affects their foraging success. It doesn't matter when you are in a large group, you are going to get the food anyway. That also so makes sense. So you make more noise, the fish gets confused anyways. Yeah. So another thing that we were looking at, not wholeheartedly but because something you know that organically came out as a part of the study was the threads. I mean the picture is self-explanatory that the dolphins and the fishing boats are very close to it. And it leads to some clear marks that the dolphins are interacting with the gear. If you look at this dolphin, the cuts are deep like the top part of the fin has been cut off. And these based on experience have come from uh, nylon fishing line. So uh, if you have ever held a nylon fishing line and tried to break it, it will cut through your fingers but you can't break it. And this tissue is, there is no bone or any hard tissue there in the uh, fin of the dolphin. You can just cut through it like cheese with this. So in a lot of cases when they go to feed from here, you see injuries like this. Another example is they get stuck in the fishing gear. Now, if you know the concept of a gill net, 
it works on you know the fish are broadest at the gills the fish goes through and then when it tries to come back it gets caught in the gills now something like a surmai is i mean large enough that the same size of net will catch it all or the nets used for large sharks so if you look at this dolphin it's a calf it's not very large it might be one and something meter ish its neck has gone through and the net has stayed long enough to cause a garret mark but luckily it's escaped you can see that clear circle around where there's been hemorrhaging or scarring so it's survived it but not all the animals are this lucky this one we photograph it's a very young calf so it doesn't even have teeth so it's probably being led by the mother very early on they are taught how to hunt now if their pot hunts from nets that's what the calf is taught so there is cultural transmission of information like that like we learn from our parents and peers same way these dolphins are learning from their parents and peers about how to hunt and this uh, dolphin was caught in a rapid net so the whole pot was inside the net and they might have escaped this guy drowned because the dolphin doesn't have enough experience to understand or don't what the circumstances were but it was i mean we saw this happen <coughs> another uh, recently developing threat was tourism i mean based on images like this you feel that I mean, what can go wrong just boats around and they're not really doing anything but put tourists on the boat who will pay you a little extra money if you go closer to the dolphin they start chasing the dolphins now the agitation you see behind the dolphin is the dolphin tail slapping like if you go near a tiger it's going to roar you go near something like a gorilla it's going to thump its chest same way the dolphin displays its stay away its aggression by slapping its tail on the water so these dolphins do this all the time when the boats come very near because they're threatened by the boats they unfortunately make for very pretty pictures slapping their tails on the water so it ends up happening a lot and we have been going to debak for i don't know about 17 16 17 years now the first time i went was in 2001 or 2 we could see dolphin inside the debak actually that was before tourism started i mean the first time we saw them were from like tarkarli standing on the road I don't think anyone. Didn't even know that what the. Yeah, we didn't know what dolf dolphin species they were. So now there has been enough traffic there that they have actually stopped using the area. So enough harassment will make them move away from the area at least temporarily. You take a prime feeding spot, put in a lot of tourists there, they don't use it. They are actually taking away resources from the dolphin without actually taking the fish out of the water. So. it becomes a problem because then you're changing behavior you're pushing these dolphins into adjoining areas it's slowly going to uh, you know reduce the population because you're increasing pressure on other areas so regulation here is key my point here that they you know are tail slapping because the dolphins are being chased by the boat uh now i mean we have always been taught not to personalize these animals because you know if i'm doing photo id and there are 20 animals around and i see my favorite animal i'm going to take 20 more pictures of that animal and ignore the others i'm going to introduce bias into my data but we are after all human so there was this one animal which really you know tugged at our hearts say so we been seeing this photo for quite some time we named this animal floopy because the famous floop over like a dog's ear and about 2 years of data we didn't know that she had a calf like a pretty large calf so much much later she she used to be quite far away from the boat and we assumed that it had to be a propeller or a neck injury and she was very wary of boats in the beginning and we kept seeing just one side of her very far away and after a while i think she started trusting our boat and we started getting amazing pictures she'd come right by and then her calf would come next to us it's quite an experience like she trusted us enough that okay this this boat doesn't move it's right here and it was like one of those experiences that bonds you with that animal which totally takes away from the research but it was a fun experience <laughs> uh so from all this data we knew where these dolphins were how many of them were there but if you want to look at a projection of 
five years from now, are the numbers going to increase or decrease? We need to look at mortality rates. And how do you know how many dolphins die? They are very near shore species. They don't go beyond 20 meters. If a dolphin dies, it's going to wash ashore. Ask the people. So we started building a community-based monitoring network like way long back. And oh, uh, back to that again, sorry. That's a uh, Rudy's Whale skull on a beach. That uh, scale there is one meter in length. So this is like a three, three and a half meter skull. Like that now. Uh, you guys have, have you seen any skulls? Yeah. Uh, so you, you have an idea of how big they are. So this one was lying on the beach. But without a scale, you don't know how large it is. So we uh, did random chats with people on the road. We made some informational booklets and posters that we put up. We did presentations in the local uh, temple. Sometimes we even did uh, presentations outside the back of our car. Like, this was uh, done during one of the turtle nesting things. Like We saw a bunch of people come. We are not going to let the opportunity go. We are going to talk about dolphins. So, <laughs> <laughs> we got a lot of people involved in uh, this way and the network really paid off. I mean, it's been more than 8-9 years that we've been doing this and we've got enough data from across the country to string together a picture of what species are found, what are the most common species and now we are getting, we are getting data fast enough that in some cases a PM can be done, a vet can be put there in place and based on that we are getting an idea of why they might be dying or what mitigation measures might be needed in the future. And this is not something that happens alone. I mean, a lot of cases, reporters helped us establish the network. Forest department gave us the permits to do it. To begin with, this is a Schedule 1 species. I can't just go and open up a dolphin. So it needed multiple players that had to work together and obviously there's going to be friction. So a lot of problems had to be sorted and it sort of came together maybe seven, eight years ago and it's been working quite well since. Uh, we are getting a lot of good data on mortality numbers. I'm not saying it's a foolproof system, but it's been working very well and we can now understand roughly what the population estimates can be. And we are also getting uh, genetic data from this. This is something I work on. I'll come to that in a bit. In these standings, uh, we also came across a blue whale calf. Now, <coughs> don't go by the size, this is a sub one year old calf. So it's like 40 feet in length, but uh, if you look at the calf, it's really slender. I mean, it's not supposed to be this way. So when we took blubber thickness, the blubber was like 6 centimeters in thickness. That's the fat on the body. So all these marine mammals rely on fat for buoyancy. So if they have less fat, they're going to require more effort to swim. They're going to sink. And as there is more effort required, they're going to utilize more fat. So once they cross this certain critical mass, it's just a downward spiral. They're going to starve to death or they're going to drown. So in this case, uh, this animal looked like it wasn't fed enough. I mean, it was at a stage where it was feeding milk off its mother. and it was not buoyant enough to swim properly. So it just died of starvation or coming on the shore. So it was just lying on the shore and slowly suffocated to death. In a lot of cases, these animals don't make it once they touch ground because their ribs are not powerful enough to support their weight. So once they touch ground, all the organs are compromised. But even if efforts are made to sort of push them back, there is enough damage internally that they're going to just die and land up on another beach. Now one morbid uh, connection that we made was that the uh, whale, the blue whale that we saw was like 200 kilometers south of where this one landed up. Our guess is that it was probably the same way. Because uh, blue whales are not that common in shallow waters. And the fact that we saw a blue whale feeding a calf and that a calf turned up a month and a half later might be the same one. Uh, we also did a lot of detailed uh, postmortems, like you saw one of them uh, where we cut up that dolphin baby and got very interesting results from it. We did that with a lot of other carcasses. 
This is a fingers clockwise uh, being opened. This one uh, was caught in a neck, like a gill neck. This is that uh, dolphin being. Very smelly work. So our approach to begin with was we did transit surveys. And based on these transit surveys, we also did more focused interviews later. I skipped that part. But uh, we were looking at, uh, in the beginning, we did interviews to look at what the fishermen could tell us about the dolphin. Later, we were looking at how aware the fishermen are about these dolphins that are in their waters. What is the level of conflict? Now, we had to be very careful, and thankfully, we had good advisors at the state where you asking questions might introduce conflict. If I go and ask a farmer, are you angry about elephants eating the bananas in your field? He may have never thought about it. He would have been like, they've been there since my grandfather, since his grandfather. They eat bananas, so what? But when I go in and raise that question, he's like, oh, maybe I, sh I should be angry. And that is something that we never thought of. And that is something our advisors you know, inculcated in us early on that your questions need to be really neutral and you need to maybe, you know, not induce these kind of uh, conflict into it. So it had to be very carefully focused interviews that we did later to look at the level of conflict. Uh, we also did a, a quick tourism appraisal. We went on these boats to look at the practices and whether uh, dolphin chasing was tourist driven or it was something that the locals actually sold it as a USB. Uh, no, fortunately for this place, the uh, locals seem to be very aware of what they're doing, and it seems to be driven by the tourists. That the tourists are adamant, and in most cases, are rowdy about these things. So it's sort of easily fixable where some government policy implemented onshore can, uh, you know, be passed on to the tourists. And it doesn't need to be against the locals, where the locals are on our side in this case, which helps us. And we, I mean, as I said, the necropsies also help get a lot of data. We got genetics, we got data on what these animals were eating, and you know, stuff that would take years otherwise you get from one necropsy. Like you get a carcass and you know at this size you get a, a you know, sexually uh, adult female, or this female has given birth and this is the length or you get sometimes uh, females that are uh, standard with a fetus inside. So you get a rough idea of when their breeding season is, which otherwise we have no way of knowing. So necropsies give us a lot of this data. So the transit surveys again gave us species richness, the distribution, and abundance only for one species though, and some behavior and acoustic data. So uh, one of the plus points of the interviews was that it also got a lot more community involvement. I mean, when we are doing interviews with locals, we kind of gauge how interested they are in what we are doing. And if they seem interested, we involve them in our network. And in such a way, we have gotten a lot of people to help us you know, give data, keep us posted on standings and stuff. So I've gone over all of this. Uh, I'll quickly go over what I've been currently doing. I'm on a sabbatical with this, but uh, I work on the genetics of this species, the humpback dolphin genus, across the entire Indian coastline. And I'm currently looking at whether the animals found on the east coast of India are a species that has been rep reported, Susa chinensis, or a completely new species, which is my hypothesis. So if you look at the animals on the west coast, which is the photos I've been showing you, they they look like Susa plumbia, they're what they're supposed to be. But if you look at the east coast animals, this is what they look like, the animals in Odisha. Uh, they don't have a hump, the color is less gray. But the ones in Tamil Nadu, again, don't have a hump, but are more gray. So they do not match the description of the animals that are found in uh, China, which is Chinensis. Uh, but are more similar to the animals found in Bangladesh. Wait, sorry. 
to have a picture of some uh, so, huh, so the, the Bangladesh animals sort of look like this. So what's interesting is that they don't look like the species that they're described to be. And I'm trying to collect genetic samples to prove that they may be a different species. It's currently in the data collection, like collecting sample stages. Let's see where it goes. So that's the hypothesis. Instead of two species, one on each coastline, we might have one species on the west coast and possibly two species or subspecies, which are new to science on the east coast of India. Uh, I'll talk about some other researchers in India. So Dipani is my advisor. Her current work, she's uh, working on the uh, humpback whales. So it's a collaborative project for all of the Arabian Sea. Uh, it started with research in Oman, and now she's doing interview-based work across the West Coast. They've uh, deployed uh, sound recording devices in Goa, in Mauritius, to make recordings of whales. So now in uh, April, mid-April, we are going to go recover uh, the hydrophones in Goa and uh, Mauritius to look at uh, humpback recordings. Uh, she's also been finding some interesting stuff like uh, uh, in Gujarat they are uh, called Dev March and uh, they build temples with them. Even here, uh, the whales are called Dev Masa, right? Or yes. Thieve. So they are considered to be, you know, holy fish. So she's been talking to fishermen about where they see them and getting secondary data. Whales are relatively easier to get data on because they're large. If you see them, you remember. So again, this is very rough data, but surveying the entire Arabian coast is very expensive. So this is the best we can do at this stage. And uh, we've all been using this marine mammal spot in uh, as a base for uh, logging our sightings and standing. So if you guys are interested, go check out the website. Uh, you want to talk about your own work? So uh, she's a PhD student in uh, James Cook University in Australia, and she's working on uh, interaction of fisheries and uh, dolphins. So she's looking at two ways in which these two mediums interact: when dolphins get caught in nets, which is bycatch, or when dolphins feed from the nets, which is depredation, and She's looking at how these uh, interactions impact both the fishermen and the dolphins. So how frequently these interactions happen, what is the impact on the dolphins, what's the impact on the livelihood of the fishermen, and whether there can be any management uh, mitigation measures that can be applied which are fair on both parts. Like you can't have management measures where you close off an area and stop somebody fishing in an area they've been fishing for generations, or you can't just be okay with dolphins dying in the next season. So it has to be some sort of middle ground that both parties are fairly treated with. Uh, yeah. So another colleague of ours, Isha, excellent picture by the way. <laughs> so uh, she works on the acoustics of the dolphin. So the recordings that I played for you, they were Isha's work. She's a PhD student in uh, Isar Tirupati. And uh, now currently she's in Marwan collecting data on this. Uh, so she's using uh, some interesting technology. She's using a toad hydrophone, which is uh, multiple microphones, uh, which are dragged behind the boat. And because there's more than one microphone, you get directionality. Mm -hmm. So it's not just recordings, you can tell the bearing of the recording and in some cases the distance it is coming from because you have a fair idea of uh, how loud the sound is produced and based on the distance you can back calculate attenuation. So if I'm farther away from you, you can hear me less loud. So that logic you can find out what direction and where these animals are. So she's trying to use them also to get uh, number of animals present. Uh, this is another colleague of ours, Divya. She works in luxury. <coughs> if you guys read the news recently about uh, new wave songs uh, being recorded in luxury, that was Divya's work. So she's working with acoustics of uh, large waves in 
the Lakshadweep theory. Another colleague, Rahul, is working on the Tamil Nadu coastline. Uh, he works with uh, fishery community interaction. So his uh, perspective, he's a PhD student in Atri. Uh, his work is largely from the uh, social aspect of this dolphin uh, fisheries interaction. And uh, I don't know if any of you guys know Abhishek Jamalabad. He's also from Bombay. Uh, he also works in Karwar. He works on uh, purse nets and trawlers, and he looks at fisheries and dolphin interaction but largely uh, offshore species, not the humpback dolphins. So he's been looking at bycatch of dolphins and purse nets and stuff like that. And this is another colleague, Mahi. She was for a long time working in the Andaman. So she was doing uh, boat based surveys and uh, interviews and she was uh, developing networks in Andaman for mon uh, monitoring mortalities and stuff. So currently, uh, Mahi is planning some GIS work, she's also enrolling for a PhD student. Just an overview of what our colleagues are doing in India at this moment. Any more questions? Anything else you guys want to ask? Yeah? Sir, there are, uh, is there any uh, geotagged individuals? Not really. So that is something we had been contemplating for some time. But it's, uh, it's very intrusive. So if you want to tag a dolphin, uh, these dolphins will not be okay uh, with suction cups because larger animals like whales, their body bends less so you can put suction cups on them. If they are smaller, the su suction cups don't stay. So you need one of those tags that go in with a bar. And recently there have been two or three cases where uh, killer whales were barbed and the barb was not sterilized properly and three whales actually died from infection, secondary infection. There have been cases where they have been shot wrong with the barb and the animals have died of shock. So it's something that we don't want to try on a Schedule 1 species because it's unnecessarily invasive. If you can get the same data over a longer period of time uh, using photo ID, why would we risk the animals, right? So it's not something we want to push at this moment. It seems easy enough, but it's a high risk thing where the risk is to the dolphin, not to us. So it's not something it's not we can do. Not good for their behavior. It may change their social behavior quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, what we've built up where the dolphins approach our boat without an issue is something that we want. If I go near a dolphin and shoot it, it's going to associate that with our boats and it's going to make all other data collection very difficult. So, targeting the first dolphin is fairly easy. Then they learn that this is an invasive thing and the boat does this. So they're smart enough to figure that out. And I feel like it's always easy to introduce new technology in research, but we never think of the long-term effects it will have, not just on the species, but the environment and other researchers as well. So that's one thing that we need to consciously think about um, as researchers working long-term in any area. With turtles, it's not invasive. It's not like it's you know, punched into their skin or something. So, and they can be hand. I mean, they come on shore conveniently. <laughs> These guys don't. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, okay. I saw uh, I saw uh, a graph uh, huh. where you were showing the uh, heat maps. Huh. So. Uh, so when when we talked about if the if the uh, and also the acoustics, yeah. So uh, if the porpoise is as you said in uh -huh. using the high frequency area, yeah. is it the same? Uh, I mean, if you have uh, you must have uh, uh, you know uh, searched or found it on the internet. So is it the same behavior all across the globe where the two species are overlapping in the ranges? We didn't find many papers. So the only paper uh -huh. that we actually found was from Pakistan, okay. which was of the aggression behavior. Okay. So. These species do share area, but nobody's explicitly mentioned any, you know, interactive behaviors between them. Okay. So even in say areas like Hong Kong and China, oh. both these species are found. Oh, okay. yeah. Susa chinensis is found and uh, Neofocina is found, hmm. but there are no known sightings together. So there seems to be like humpback dolphins are fairly aggressive species. Yeah, they've been known to like if. Yeah. A mother calf pair is uh, approached. Like there was one case in Hong Kong where a tiger was held down. He approached a mother 
calf pain, and the dolphin sat on him, <laughs> caused rib fractures and stuff. Just, I mean, it's a huge animal protecting its offspring, so they're not very friendly or anything of that sort, and they are very aggressive. So another thing uh, I miss is that dolphin, the calf, calf that died. Uh, one of the experts hypothesized that the injury looks like a, a rostrum of a dolphin. So it's most probably got caught in male-male combat and got like butted so hard that it died. So they are huge, very strong, aggressive species. Uh, second question I had was uh, regarding the uh, feeding curve. Huh. So have you studied that part of it? Because when you said that there is a bycatch and you know other things, there is a lot of uh, competition between the for the fisheries and all. But then when you, uh, I mean, this is just a guess that yeah. when you PM it, uh, huh. do you find any food or you know? So we you know? find a lot of fish remain, but we haven't really bothered to go through them. Like we need someone who has expertise in identifying autolids yeah. and. I think all of us got busy with our PhDs and the samples are just sitting there. Okay. So I... Also, most of the uh, dead animals, sorry for using these terminal dead individuals that we caught were calves. So the, uh, the remains were basically like milky. Mm -hmm. okay. There was no fish in them. So that itself is a very... I don't know, bad sign or what sign. Maybe I'm just like personalizing it. Mm -hmm. but the no calves get caught easily in nets, probably because they haven't developed the intelligence mm. to Experience. translate yeah. the, uh, you know, learned behavior into action very well. They haven't learned to get out of nets or whatever. So we don't know yet. That's what I'm going to go now and look at by talking to the new fishermen. I see I, what happens. I take a slightly more positive perspective to it. That fecundity curve, when you look at any animal's uh, age growth curve, it's always a tapering curve. Mm -hmm. So you're going to always have maximum number of mm. juveniles, juveniles or yeah. young. Yeah. And as the age grows, there are less number of individuals. So mortality is going to be a function of that curve. Mm -hmm. So there are more young animals to die, so more young animals are found there. Mm -hmm. just, no. just the perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just going to be a reflection of that curve, right? Because if you expect same mortality rates, yeah. which is not actually what she's saying is right. But because mortality rates are generally higher for neonates. So, but this is another perspective to it. Yeah, and you're talking. What you're saying is it should be a natural sort of reflection of the population curve. Yeah, this is yeah. prodigality. I know, I know. Yeah. Huh. So, uh, another uh, thing to your question: these guys have very fast metabolism. So, in a lot of cases, we found empty stomachs. And the other option is remove the entire intestine and do this to it. Mm -hmm. We haven't been able to. Because by the time we reach the carcass, it's unbearable, like stinking. Yeah, not just that, like the intestine, when you touch it, it disintegrates. Oh. So, so, so like we learned on the job, so we are not trained uh, veterinarians. Yeah, yeah the vets so, generally refuse to do this. So, so we started doing this, so we started learning, oh, if you cut here, we get this organ. And we had no idea how to work. So everything that we know is because we have cut only so many animals open to perform PLs and then talk to different veterinarians who are abroad who said the only option is to take out the entire stomach and literally just oh, yeah. yeah, so like yeah, nah, we are not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> We've tried this. We've tried this. I mean it just breaks up all your work. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But I mean it's also yeah. a function they have multi chambered stomachs by the way. Huh. They're ungulates. Yeah. So they're related to cows and the hippopotamus. Mm. So it's a system that was developed for herbivores, but it works excellent for fish because it ferments fish and digests it completely. completely. So you get very quick digestion time and you hardly get anything as remains. So when we go through the stomach, we have hardly ever found it. Yeah. <laughs> also, they're one of the few monodon uh, mm. Mammals, yeah. like you guys must have learned dentition in your first year. I'm assuming mammal dentition, yeah. heterodonts. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any more? Yeah. Sir, a uh, few months ago, uh, an forest department caught some people with the amber bees. Oh God. Huh. <laughs> so uh, why it's uh, illegal or what is the use of this? 
I don't think it should be illegal. But I'm not the one making the rules. Also, I don't know if the ambergris like God was actually ambergris. Because the last time we went and met a fisherman who showed us ambergris, uh, it was sewage. Sewage forms in the sea and forms floaty yellow yeah. containers, which look like ambergris. Okay? It's not ambergris. So, ambergris is super rare. We still don't know whether it is whale vomit, whether it is whale fat deposits, whether it is whale yeah. Nobody really knows yeah. what it is. No one knows. Okay. Only male sperm whales produce it. And yeah. So, most of the time, what we think is found as ambergris is probably not ambergris. So, I mean, the reason for it being seized has more to do with economic offenses and it funding illegal activities and less to do with wildlife. So, you know, a lot of the seizures are not through the forest department. They yeah. happen through the uh, ED wing or, you know, through the police. police yeah. And that's so, also a function of social disparity because something is rare, it is... Yeah. And, I mean, in a way it's a non-consumptive product. I mean, you're not, uh, you know, killing the animal for it. So, you're not actually you know, doing any harm to a whale. In my book, it's not something that should be, but that's not my call to take. <laughs> okay. <laughs> any more questions? Uh, yeah, I have. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I had one more question. So, the way you showed that you're trying to, uh, you're trying to figure it out whether it's a two species or three species, I yeah. huh. So, I had a question that the way you're working in Goa and you said about Gurudeshwar, huh. are there any people who are working through Kerala and... No, no, so my work is across the coast. Entire, entire coast. Okay. So, I've been developing a network, I've been handing out yeah. sampling kits for the past three years. Okay. Yeah, that, that was a fun PhD idea when I started. It's not anymore. But then uh, you get the same type of film and other things in the Kerala or the entire West Coast. Yes. West Coast, yes. There's a break in population in South Kerala. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if you go to the last few districts of Kerala, the water is extremely deep. Okay. And these are obligate shallow water species. Yeah. So they will not be found more than 20, 30 meters of water. So when the water becomes very deep, uh, it's a break in habitat for them. Okay. So, I mean, in biogeography terms, you treat this shallow water patch as an island, hmm. and the next one as another island. Hmm. So, there will be rare events of migration between these islands. The more the distance between these two islands, the higher the chances that there is species separation. Okay. And have you done any time, any water parameters for this? Like Not really. Okay. It's too large a scale to do water. Yeah. Yeah. So, at the most, I'm going to do bathymetry gradient. Okay. Before that, I need samples from the east. No, because you talked about the ecosystem goal, because you know, so much of overlapping and the shallow waters, the species and the fisheries are also intense at that point. So, probably, as you said, it is a very rich from food. Uh, yeah. So, probably the same thing that is happening in Sanjay Gandhi National Park. Huh. A lot of leopards, small species, but just because of the very rich diversity of, for the food, probably they are, you know, I come very, uh, you know, uh, gathering huh. in one place and strike probably and uh, still very less conflict with the surrounding area. Yeah. So, uh, if at all it is that, then, you know, uh, the water might give some... Uh, not not my question to answer. I am just trying to separate these species. Okay. I don't want to go into the ecology of why they separate. Yeah, yeah. That's a much more detailed question for which you need a lot of background. Yeah. So, yeah. So, this is becoming difficult enough to answer. I have samples yeah. from the west coast, I have nothing from the east coast. Right? Three or four samples because I've been working here for 10, 12 years. Yeah. I have a good enough network. The East Coast is something I started six months before the lockdown. So, didn't go in. <laughs> That's why I quit my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> for now. For now. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. The same thing occur in shadow waters. Are there uh, records of them occurring in England uh, waters? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, it, is dependent on the depth of the river and the width of the river. So they go up the Zwari. So have you guys been to Goa? Any of you? Uh, so the bridge that you are crossing in Panji, you can see them from that bridge. So that's 10 kilometers in from the shore. Uh, we did a rescue in uh, Nagotni. Nagotni, yeah, that was 23 kilometers up the river. They had gone up that uh, creek and I mean they were stuck 
But basically they go there often following fish. At night they will go in with the fish into the rivers. So it depends on how large the river is and whether the food resources are rich enough. But it's a common occurrence all across. In Hong Kong, there's a large navigable river, so they go in. In Kerala, they found uh, a long way inside the estuary. So uh, there's a navy dockyard and a port, and you see these navy ships going really fast, and there are dolphins just they're unaffected. So Kochi, you see them all the time in a very busy waterway. So they don't seem to be affected by noise or pollution or boat traffic, nothing. They, in uh, Kerala, they are called uh, sea pigs. <laughs> wow. Called cuddle pali, which is You see them in the blackest, dirtiest water. I mean, which is a sign that they have adapted to, you know, disturbed environments. Not that they are only found there. But similar to what crows and pigeons have done, they have managed to be there in spite of us. Hmm? The snout. The evolution of the snout is very reminiscent of river dolphins. Oh. River dolphins. Yeah. Huh. So these guys have a very narrow beak uh, as compared to other dolphins. Also, uh, they have very, very flexible heads. So most of the offshore dolphins that you see, uh, the uh, atlas and axis are fused. Hmm. So this movement and this movement doesn't okay. exist. Yeah. So, because then the muscle attachment can be at the back of the skull and not at the shoulder. Mm -hmm. So, you get these seven vertebrae which are compressed into one and it gives you better mobility. But these animals have sort of foregone that mobility. So, these dolphins will be on the surface sideways, okay? Like, they'll be floating like this, they look down and they use their sonar. So, because they're in such shallow waters, other dolphins are facing downwards. Mm -hmm when they are using the sonar. But imagine you are in half a meter of water and you are two and a half meters long. So the only way you can do that is by getting neck flexible. So it's a evolutionary uh, you know, convergence because they are not related to river dolphins mm -hmm. at all. They are delphinids, they are related to something like a bottlenose dolphin. But this is an evolutionary pathway that's occurred multiple times in the dolphin genome. Any other question? So, if you have any more questions, just email them. I'll be happy to answer. Them. <laughs> Thank you so much. No worries. Actually, yeah, if you guys are up for volunteering, we have studies going. So, uh, just take our email down the.kcrd at gmail.com. Please email, and if we have slots, we'll be more than happy to have you. MSC, no, they're all above 18. <laughs> Liability cost. Can you just repeat the The PHE dot KCRT. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> ah, yes. I was trying to avoid that. Yeah. Anyways, capital is not the same. Yes, it is. 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 Unless somebody has that specific email, you get it. So the email ID is there on the screen. You can just note it down. Okay. Yeah, for a long time we have been saying no project, sorry, no volunteering, but now we have projects. <laughs> it was definitely an engaging and encouraging talk. Thanks. And thank you so much. And I'm sure the students are inspired to work on such less studied animals. So, uh, at the end of the session, I would like to request Mr. Siddharth Surve to uh, deliver a vote of thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, so, on behalf of Mangrove Cell and Mangrove Foundation, I would like to thank our speaker, Amogi, for being here with us today on such a short notice and delivering a wonderful lecture. 
and uh, you know sharing his experiences and uh, his observations from the studies and also highlighting uh, the opportunities in this field. Uh, moving on, I would like to thank Dr. Manas Mandarikar for being here with us today uh, on uh, and you know uh, being a part of the discussion with uh, the faculty. And uh, also, I would like to thank the principal and uh, teachers of Andhra College, especially Ashutosh, who has been coordinating this event for a long time. Uh, then I would like to thank my colleagues, uh, Rishikesh, uh, Jayesh, Sai, for making this event successful. And lastly, I would like to thank uh, NG Kokri, who is the range first officer for Tanik Victor Vigo Sanctuary, for making this money available uh, today uh, with us. And unfortunately, he had some other commitments, so he couldn't be with us today. And with this, uh, we can do today's session. Thank you so much. Thank you.